Hi, I'm Dean. I'm from Bluevine. Uh, one slide about Bluevine. Bluevine, what, what we're doing is we're giving online loans to businesses in the United States. And what data science is Bluevine is basically bridging the gap between fast and risky. Because when you're giving loan to people, you're, you're getting risk, right? You're not sure you're getting the money back. So I can tell you, let's investigate this business for 10 days by 20 people. I can give you a very sure loan. I can also tell you, let's give them a loan after 20, 10 minutes of research, but then I have a lot of risk. So what we're doing in data science is trying to mitigate that risk and do it fast and bridging that trade-off. Uh, what we're doing, we analyze risk, we analyze fraud, uh, we build data pipelines of many data sources. How we do it, basically you want to make models. And what this is the holy grail for a data scientist, right? You have many users and you have many features and now you can build amazing models. The thing is, in the real world, data doesn't come that way. The data comes like this. We have many data sources. On top of those sources, we built intermediate models that tell us, give us information about some stuff. And then on top of that, we build the actual models that say, well, this business is a good business, it's a bad business, we can give this uh, $20,000 loan or $100,000 loan. That, this is what we're doing. This gets into our database, and the thing in the middle is our database. We don't store the data as this holy grail thing that we've, we've seen earlier. We're starting this as a streamline of timestamps with data values. Uh, this can go wrong, and this part can go wrong. Uh, many anomalies could happen in between because we're tracking a lot of features on many timestamps, and uh, we're tracking many, many features, basically. This can go wrong. So what do we do? We want to analyze if anomalies happen on that part, because uh, anomalies are basically the way to get corrupt, corrupted data. Uh, if you have an if something just stopped talking to you, well, you you will notice that because the model will just don't work. But if some underlying thing goes wrong, the model, the final model, will still work, but would give you bad results. So we want to monitor that and see when that happens. A bit of what's going to happen in this talk. So I'm going to talk about my anomaly detec uh, detection project because I've done the work and I want to share it with you. Because why would I be the only one to enjoy it? Uh, the thing is, I built my first neural network in this project. I didn't know uh, on new neural networks, but I haven't actually coded one before then. Uh, m m m a lot of the talk would be about pandas, because I love pandas, and about modern pandas, because many people, many of us, who's using pandas? Because not all of you are data scientists, I guess, because this is a joint conference. Awesome. Pandas is basically something that gives you a uh, an object that's kind of like an Excel table that you can interact with with Python. And so I'm going to talk about modern pandas because many data scientists don't use a lot of the f uh, functionality that the modern pandas use. Some of us stopped, like we started at the beginning of like pandas.17 and now we're at .23 and we're not using the extra functionality that Pandas is giving us, it gives us a lot of stuff that we're used to from, let's say, R. The last thing would be uh, talking about some things in Python. I'm saying I love Python. Uh, I was really excited for talking PyCon uh, because Python is a friend, not a foe. Many data scientists just want to do data science, and the, the language is kind of the, the, the gap. Like, I'm not interested in the language, I'm just interesting, interested in my models, and well, the language is what I have to do to actually build them. So I want to say Python is your friend, it will help you a lot as once you get to know it. Okay, so I started with exploring, and uh, basically what I wanted to see is how our variables are reacting, are acting, because we have many of them, and we decided to, well, let's see, we're tracking, we're tracking each variable in, independently, a variable is a feature. And we can see on the plot in the right section, uh, I use Matplotlib, by the way, because that's the best visualization library that exists. Um, no, I'm kidding. Bokeh is excellent, but uh, I'm, I'm really good with this one, and I'm not yet good with Bokeh. 
Uh, so we, we've understood that we want to track the monitor, the, we want to monitor the counts data. We can actually monitor a lot of other things like the values, right? How the values change how, and how other th things change. In this product, we just want to see the counts data and how it reacts. And on the right part, you can see uh, the progression of the counts in a different uh, time interval. So on the top one, you can see a 15 minute interval. On the, uh, on the last one, you can see one day interval, and, but they present the same data. Uh, I've understood that, well, but the data doesn't come as counts, right? I need to do something that actually counts that. And eventually I've understood that I need to go into something like a microservice uh, architecture. It's in uh, parentheses because I'm not sure formally on CS uh, definition that's actually a microservice architecture, but it's something like it. Uh, I'll explain later about the microservice architecture and how through that we're going to swim through the model. But I'll start with the uh, modern pandas and I'll start with the penny drop moments. I call them choir moments also because first of all, when the penny drops, you can hear the choir sing hallelujah. The thing is the word choir is a very weird word, right? When I would talk to someone, I will tell them the choir sings and that's okay. That's a word I know. When I read choir, well, it's kind of a weird word, right? It comes from French with the O-I, the C-H is, that's weird. But I was always okay with it because you're reading it fluently and you're talking fluently and that's okay. But when the first time I came to write that, I was like, how do you write choir? Well, K-W, so I wasn't sure, but then the penny dropped. Oh, choir, that's choir. Cool, awesome. So stuff like that happened to me in Python all the time. Let's say you have a tuple, right? You want to say x is one, two, three, then you reach the end of line. What can you do? Well, you do the comma and then you just drop a line. You don't need a backslash or something like that. You just do it and that's okay. Well, the penny drop, I can do it in pandas. I can actually do the, uh, put everything inside a tuple or just open parenthesis and just df, then dot group by, then dot count. Well, this seems weird because that, that's a one-liner, but what happens if this is, this is my pipeline? So my pipeline is now I'm setting an index, I'm dropping NAs, I'm renaming stuff, I'm assigning stuff, that's a lot. So that's, that's the first uh, trick that I'm teaching you today is that you can actually do that and then the nice part, uh, well, the nice part is later, but you can comment out stuff along the line and then you just comment out things in the pipeline and see if it still works. You don't need to actually go down the line and stuff like that, comment in the middle of the line and things like that, things you do when you research. This code is actually turning the top part into the bottom part. The top part is that uh, time signatures and the bottom part are counts. I wanna go over uh, three, th three things that might actually help you. So uh, who's done date indexing? Show of hands. Dates are scary. Andrew said that yesterday dates are scary. But the thing is, pandas is now cool. It just helps you with them. And once you do a set index on a date, it knows how it's, it knows it's a date. And the first thing you can do, well, you can just get, uh, index by it. You can just uh, slice by it. Here in this point, I want to say, give me all the data from January 2017. I just give it a string and pandas know about it. So I hope we learned something new. Second one is resample. Uh, I remember during my thesis, I also had time data and it was a mess. I needed to, well, first of all, what's the time? So I needed to make another column of what's the hour and what's the date. Uh, and then group by those things and stuff like that. Well, that was a mess. Today in modern pandas, you can just resample. I give it a string D means day, and you just group by the day. You can give it the string one hour, you can give it the, th uh, the string six hours, and then it's a group by object. So you can just apply count and you count uh, the thing. Another thing is a sign. Well, that's just a nice trick. It's not a must, but when you do df and then a column equals, it assigns something, you can do it inside your pipeline instead of doing many variable uh, assignments. Then what I've said earlier, just coming it out if you don't like it and uh, it still works in the pipeline. If, you don't, if you've done a one-liner, well, that would have been harder. Uh, a little more about the date index. It's 
awesome. And you can also use columns that are not indexed using the DT accessor. You can uh, ask it for a day. You can ask it for a year. You can even floor now. Uh, that's pretty new in Pandas. Uh, I tell me, tell me what hour is this? So I said previously that when I wanted uh, to floor the day, well, then I would give me the day, then give me the day, then concatenate them. That that was a mess. Today is not like that. I can just tell it, give me the flow of one hour, or give me the flow of three days, right? So you then you can have timestamps of three days, then you can group by if you haven't resampled before. You, Pandas now has rolling and expanding windows and uh, exponential weighting, weighted moving averages or means. Uh, Pandas has all of that. Uh, back to a bit of my project. So three packages that you might use if you don't want to do it yourself. Uh, there's Luminal, LinkedIn, Donut, and Skyline. Uh, Skyline is no longer maintained, so when I see that line, I just move on, even if it's a great package. Uh, Donut seems nice, but it actually teaches you how to implement TensorFlow. And because I, I'm say, I was, as I was saying, my first neural network, so I was going for the basic. I was using Keras, and we'll show you later. And Luminal by LinkedIn, it seems like a great package. Uh, I finally, I decided not to use it, but you can uh, search for those names and uh, try it. This is the microservice ar architecture. I'm updating, uh, so I'm just updating the counts. Then I'm training my models. I'm retraining them every so often. And then now when I have a new pre uh, observation, I can predict uh, what I would have expected. And then if my prediction and my real data are far enough, I would alert that that's a bad thing. How does it go? So the update part, it just acts as a sensor. I come from the Air Force and what we had there, you have sensor that just tell you each 10, each 10 second period, it says this was the temperature. And you know it gets, you gets the data every 10 seconds. With timestamp data, you don't get it. You just get it when it happens. So you need a sensor, the a sensor that tells you each hour, well, this hour was five counts, this hour was 50 counts. And we can see now, we can create a chart uh, that's, that, shows how, that shows how the variables are acting. And you can see that they act differently. The purple one is a lot lower than the orange and blue one. And they act differently on the weekends, on, on weekdays. And even if we take another variable, well, we see all of them are very low. And the other one is just uh, acting a lot differently than the others. So this is what the sensor is doing. And that's one. Uh, basic element in this architecture. I'm just counting those. So, so this is what it's doing. It just counts because I didn't have count data before. Awesome. How do you do that? So a few things. First of all, who's heard of the pipe method? Uh, I've learned of it uh, when I came to this project. This is awesome. When Remember the pipes I wanted to do uh, earlier and I'm just uh, going down the line each time. I can now pipe functions. So uh, all the uh, functions inside the pipes are functions that I've written. And now it's nice because it, it's, it's, it's telling a story, right? I count the rights, I pad the rights with some zeros when I, where I need them, and then I expand the DB counts with some extra data, like is it a weekend, is it an holiday? And that's it. The pipes tell the story. You can do this by uh, variable assignment. I know uh, in this case you could have. But if you wanted to actually index in between or stuff like that, that's a very nice method if you come from R uh, that's something they do a lot. Specifically, uh, let's look at the pad vector counts. Well, what happens if I want to say, let's see the counts between 10 and 9, uh, 10 and 1. But the thing is, my data starts from 11. So Pandas is good with counting that, but it would start counting from 11. It wouldn't give me a zero counting at the hour 10, right? So I need to write a date range. So this is one thing. A date range just give you an index of Pyth of pandas with the, the hours you need. Then later, I can tell it, well, instead of the index that came from the resampling and counting, I can re tell, I'm telling this index re-index like the index I want. Then there's if, if there's another hour, then it will just give me this hour. It would give me uh, none values, and then I can fill them with zeros. 
Anybody learn something new from that? Okay, so now I'm fitting the data. I have aggregated data of all the counts that I've counted before, right? I can go a half a year before, and now I have data for, a training, for training a model. I can also use, I can do a train and test split, six months, then one month of testing myself. And all of this, uh, the training data also needs to go through a data cleaning pipeline. So I'm using the pipe clean. The thing is, I'm cleaning on a, another file. I'm giving it data. I'm just telling it how to clean. Now there's a new data. I can just give it pipe clean. I'm implementing clean in another different place. And that's, that's the beauty of uh, pandas and Python. Python is your friend. Don't do long pipelines that just you would that you would get lost in along the way separate the parts like software engineers do, do and uh, use python to your advantage i would just pipe clean clean is somewhere else along the lines of clean i have create sliding windows i have process input all of this is getting data it creates sliding windows right the I know I want to predict the next hour. I need a few hours before, so I need to create sliding windows. I'm I'm doing all of that with functions, and uh, well, I get back to that later. Uh, and and the only thing is when I'm saying training through, uh, training true, it cleans the data using a pipe clean. Also, use Python to your advantage. Assert stuff. Who's using assert? Not many. So the thing is. Uh, let's say I have uh, six months of data, right? right and I know the date, so I know how many hours should be between this and that date. If there aren't those many, that many hours, well, something wrong, and I will. I know maybe sklearn would fail, maybe uh, pandas would fail later, maybe Keras would fail. I have no idea where it's gonna fail, but I know it's gonna fail. So why not? So I can fail it, right? Because sklearn would give you something like um, dimensions not good. Uh, parentheses, tuple, something. But I can say, well, I can give it a meaningful message using the assert. So I call it a U-turn, right? I enter the function. If, it, if the data is not good, I'm just exiting. I'm, uh, I'm giving an error, and I can just alert the person, well, the code's doing something bad. This is the neural network park, where I'm training a Keras model, the just a fully connected model. I'm taking a few hours back, a week back, and I'm trying to predict what's the uh, observation should have been, what's the prediction. And it optimizes from, uh, for a MAE, and that, that's a good trade-off between, uh, some of you would ask why not do LSTMs, because LSTMs are the great new things for time data. And, but th that's a good trade-off, because for a univariate data, apparently, you don't need, actually, LSTMs. So I hope, uh, so uh, fully connected neural networks are a good trade-off of uh, efficiency and giving you good results. How I do that, this is the entire model of the entire project. It's a Keras model. And my recommended recommendation is, do it in a function, right? Use Python to your advantage. Use it somewhere else. Then when I update the model, I just update this model because I know the model would take care of everything. It has an input, it has an output. I know it's going to work. So I'm just using it uh, inside its own function. And if another thing you can use Python to your advantage is something called partial. You have, you have func tools and partial. So you can say, I have a new function that's kind of like the other function. With, but with the parameters I know. So I can tell you make model is the function make dense model, but with, with different parameters, like with 60 nodes instead of uh, 32, and the loss would be MAE instead of the MSC that I'm saying there. And the, and the beautiful thing is now you can create a list of all those make models that are based on just one or two uh, definitions, but you can create a list of many different uh, architectures. Another thing is that now you can give a function that, that gets a function and just tell it, well, build this function according to this function. For this, I need the partial function that I've created before. Use Python to your advantage. It's doing great stuff. Back to the story, I'm, I'm, I have now predictions. And the thing you're looking at at the, at the right part are the uh, predictions on the training data. And now I can create errors, right? So I'm, I'm trying to see how am I, 
uh, how do I, what do I call an anomaly? An anomaly is if I have predicted data and real data and they're far enough, I'm saying that's an anomaly. What's far enough, I need to fit some distribution to tell me if those are uh, on the edges, well, that's far enough and that's an anomaly. So I'm creating uh, the progression of the errors. That's what you've seen, the orange on top of the blue. If you're doing this minus that, you get that. And now you can see that you have three distinct points that are uh, actually screaming, well, this is kind of weird. So I can take that, I can put it in a histogram, and then I can fit a distribution on it. And the next time, and that you're gonna see it now in the part that's called predict, on the next time I'm seeing uh, I have an error, I can see, well, where does it fit along the distribution? And if it's far enough, well, that's an anomaly. I'm saving all the data of the model, well, all the metadata of the model, I'm saving this to the database, and I'm saving the model itself to S3, because every time I want to predict, I need to load them back. This is what's gonna happen. On the first part, I have a new observation, right? The hour is finished. I can now count how many writes I've had in the last hour. I'm counting that. That's the real data. Okay, now I have the, uh, this hour and I have a week back, I can deploy my model again, ask it what you would have expected, and giving the expectation, I can now in the middle part, again, draw the orange on top of the blue, see the errors on the bottom part, see how the error progresses, and ask, is it an anomaly? In this case, it is not, because it's not uh, far enough from the middle point. In this part, in this another variable, you can see this, this is an anomaly because the error is so far away from what I would have expected, so I would alert the data scientist, each, each model as an owner, so I can uh, send the person an email and tell, him, tell them this is an anomaly. Luckily, we have the pipeline, right? I have a new observation. I've cleaned it on a different part. I've saved the metadata on a different part. I've done everything else using Python. Now I can just get them all back, deploy my pipeline, and that's it. I have the observation, and I'm deploying the pipeline, and that's what I'm doing. I'm, do I'm giving them, I'm creating a scaler for, from sklearn because uh, neural networks like scaling, uh, and I have the information about the range from the metadata that I saved. I can also create sliding windows from the metadata that I, that I saved, and also it's part of the pipeline. Eventually I process the input, I load the CURS model, I have information of where it is on the cloud uh, from the metadata that I saved. Uh, basically, make sure when you're creating models, save all the metadata uh, somewhere that you can recreate them quickly. One exception, the models themselves are pretty big, so you can't save them into a database, so save them into a file, but save the entire metadata that can recreate that file. Let's say uh, S3 in New York stops working, that happened last year, you can just recreate that once you move to another server. Uh, last thing, use Python to your advantage. Uh, get attribute, who's using it? So I have, I have information that the distribution that I fitted in this case was a NCT. It's a non-central T distribution. Well, I can't save a non-central T distribution object into our database, but I can save a string that says NCT. The thing is, SciPy stats doesn't know what uh, what's the string is, but Python can translate strings into method names. So you can use that. Uh, eventually, I'm creating a dictionary that's going into some charting. A again, I've saved all the metadata, all the data that I need to create a chart. Once I have an anomaly, I can create a chart, and this chart shows you uh, what I had in the data, what are the predictions. It can show you previous anomalies. In this case, this is actually a real story. As you can see, we, had an act we actually did something wrong on ap April 30th, but we've noticed it just on May 15th, that's the farther part, farthest far part for me, and you can see that actually the many red points are our fix, but if you look at the data close enough, you can see that four days later we could have seen, the, we could have seen it and fixed it, but we just fixed it uh, 15 days later. So 
I have this chart. Now I can send this chart to someone. This is what this is what the um, data scientist will get. And the part that excites me the most, this is where my project was done for today. What the part that excites me the most, it asked the data scientist, is it a real anomaly, right? Because I was shooting in the dark. The, the thresholds for the distribution, I was shooting in the dark. I said, well, 1% and 99% seem cool. I have no idea. The thing is now that the, the data scientist would answer, this is an anomaly, then in a year or so, I can come back and do supervised learning to find those uh, thresholds. Some example, that's, that's a pretty good example because you can see there's an anomaly after, it, it runs for a lot of time, then there's an anomaly. That's nice, that's a worse example because you see there are many more anomalies that you would have expected. But it, it's a good model, but probably the uh, thresholds are not, well, uh, not tuned as well as I would have hoped so. And this is a bad example, right? Because here, what I, what I can tell you is you can see that there's no actually uh, fitted distribution. That's because the neural network part uh, didn't learn so well uh, how, it, how it behaves. And if you can see the zoom part, well, the, the bottom right is the zoom of the uh, part on the top. You can see, well, it doesn't really have anything, any structure that I can actually see, so the neural network doesn't pick that up. If I have a bad model, I, I still send the email, but I have a big red line on top that says, well, this is a bad model, consider ignoring this for, for this time. Conclusions, you don't need a PhD to deploy neural networks. There are some amazing projects with PhD in machine learning, and you can see networks that are, I don't know, 200 layers deep with billions of parameters, and that they're doing amazing. The, thing, the fact that I can search my cats on Google Images, that's amazing to me. I, it's still the future, but you don't need it. You can deploy a pretty small function that's neural networks, and they predict, and they do it well, and they're, they're just doing the jobs, and you can do it in a month. Uh, pure Python has a lot more to offer than you use. All of us, including me, even though I'm the advocate of doing that, each time I'm just looking at Python build things and I learn a new thing. I know you're, many data scientists just want to deploy models, but you, you are using Python, so use it to your advantage. And diving into pandas is a lot faster than inventing pandas, right? We use pandas. Uh, we'll eventually get what we want. The thing is how hard we worked for it. The, the thing with resample by day, that was amazing to me. I actually did that before, right? I was grouping by, then I was making another column. It took me two days of work just to make this work, and it worked slow. If, had I known about resampling, well, that would have saved me two days and two days of waiting later for the code. Uh, those are the main conclusion. This is me. Uh, my Facebook is the greatest source in the internet of combining data science and dead jokes, so you're welcome. And uh, that's it. Thank you.